This is Chapter 1 of Mastering ArcGIS by Mary Beth Price, 5th edition. How maps portray the world. This slide just shows four different things. It shows point features, such as these, line features, this is a road, a polygon feature, this is a waste pond, and annotation features, which are labels. We have generalization here. These are maps of the same area. This is a Google Earth digital globe image, and this is a USGS digital raster graphic. And what this is pointing out is some errors on the USGS digital raster graphic. It's old. There's a missing a garage or a house here, and this appears as a road on the USGS map. Generalization and scale. That was annoying. Generalization and scale. In this map, the scale is about 1 to 2400, a USGS map. This is about 1 to 50 million. The larger the number down here, the larger area that we cover. You can think of it as this is a smaller fraction, 1 over 24,000, and this is a small fraction, 1 over 24,000, and this is even smaller fraction because such is a large number. Think of this as a portion of a dollar, and this is a much bigger portion. It's the ratio of the size on the ground to the size on the map, and the scale influences the generalization of the features. Here's another generalization image. Here's a large scale map, intermediate scale map, and a very small scale map. Small scale maps show more than the large scale maps. And notice in this image over here, this map, the town of Portsmouth is a point. Here it looks like a polygon. And here it isn't even represented. We're actually down to the side to individual features within the town of Portsmouth. GIS data models. We're going to learn about vector data models. Use them most of the time during this course. And also raster data models. This over here is a raster that was created from a vector. Vectors being points, lines, and polygons. And the rasters being individual grids. So this is a cell, this is a cell, that's a cell, that's a cell. Vector models. These are stored as a series of XY coordinates in a rectangular coordinate system. They can have one of three types. A point, a line, or a polygon. A polygon consists of lines, which consists of points, or nodes. Here we have nodes at the ends of the line, and then this is a connected point and line. Features and attributes. This shape is a polygon, and the polygons are indicated here. Right now there are three selected, Washington, Mon Montana, and Idaho. That's why they're light blue, and that's why they show up light blue on this map. Then we have the individual states as themselves. For example, Washington, it looks like it's pointing to California, but here is Washington, and it gives us some attributes, a population in 1990, population in 2000, and of course now we'd have population 2010 because the census has been redone. Each feature is linked to an entry in a data table containing information about the feature. These are called attributes. Feature classes. A feature class is a collection of similar objects with the same attributes stored as a single unit. This is a states feature class. Each line is an individual state. A rivers feature class. 
lists each individual river and then a capitals feature class which lists each individual capital. Advantages of vectors, which are points, lines, and polygons. Precise location of features. You may store many attributes. They're very flexible for cartography. There's a very compact storage of information. And they're ideally suited for certain types of analysis, especially areas, lengths, and connections. Connecting of streets, connecting of rivers. Storing surfaces. This image is of contours. You've seen contour maps before. This is a tin, triangular, irregular network. And this is a raster. All of these depict the same general area, as you can see the peak here, the peak here, and the peak here. But they're different ways of storing them and displaying them. This is a tin. Triangular Irregular Network. We don't use them in this course, but it's good to know what they are. Digital Elevation Model. We will be using DEMs, or Digital Elevation Model. These are individual cells or pixels, and the constant in this area, in this grid, or the DEM, is the regularly spaced individual cells. We're controlling for space because of each cell is a specific size. Most cases they'll come in as 30 by 30, 30 meters by 30 meters, but there's infinite number of different size of cells. The raster data model is shown here on georeference to an earth surface. We have columns, we have rows, this XY location is the same as this XY location. We'll use rasters when we get to chapter 8. Continuous data. That's where the raster shines. Raster is the best way to store continuously changing values such as elevation or distance. Analysis is faster and more flexible than vectors for many applications and some analysis is only possible using rasters. Discrete rasters. These are a little different. Discrete rasters essentially store features but in the raster format. For example, everything in this blue 10 has similar information. Everything in the 14, they're all similar. So those, these are discrete. They have relatively few values that change abruptly from one category to another. And here we have what looks like roads and also rivers, or these could be just smaller roads. It's tough to tell without a legend. Continuous rasters. Stored continuous rasters store surfaces of field of variables that change continuously over space. Many they have many potential values. Adjacent cells rarely share the same value. And that is noticeable by the shading of the white to gray, to tan, to red, to yellow, to green, and also air photos. Those are rasters, and those are similar to pictures, where you have pixels as the cells. Scanned images can also be used in GIS. This is a scanned image of a map, a USGS topo map, and it's called a digital raster graphic, or DRG. Picture files. Any map picture file could be potentially used as a GIS data source. However, it must be georeferenced, which means register it to a known coordinate system before we use it in GIS. In the certificate program at UW Tacoma, there is a specific lab based on georeferencing. value raster versus a picture raster. This is a value raster. There are different values to this raster. It would be a DAM or land use raster. 
and often used for analysis, whereas a picture raster stores arbitrary color values that have no direct relation to the quantity or the apt attribute, and they're used as background pictures only. Impact of resolution. What does resolution mean? Well, if we look at these two images, they're of a similar area, although in this one it's 90 meter resolution. Each of these cells is 90 meters in length, whereas in this image, that each of these cells is 10 meters. So there's approximately nine of these, essentially nine of these in these over here. And actually, you can tell that it's going to be choppy in the 90 meter resolution. Portraying large areas at high precision is problematic because there's a lot of data in there. Storing attributes. Roads may have other attributes, ownership, speed limit, number of lanes, etc. If this were a raster, you'd have to have a new raster for each attribute. Only numeric attributes may be stored. The raster contains one value indicating a single, single attribute such as road type. And again, we'll get to a lot of raster information in Chapter 8. Raster analysis functions. You can do density, distance, interpolation, buffers. We'll actually do buffers on some vectors in this course. View shed analysis. In this image, everything that can be seen from this point is highlighted red. And least cost path indicates the least expensive in terms of resources to get from this point to this point. Coordinate systems. Every GIS data set uses X and Y and sometimes Z values to locate geographic data. The Z would be the elevation. The choice of these values is the coordinate system. A data set is said to be geo-referenced. Some familiar coordinate systems can be found on a general topo map. We have degrees, we have other references to other coordinate systems along the side. XY coordinate systems in unit, there are latitude and longitude with degrees. State plane is read in feet, and then UTM is read in meters. And we have meters here, we have degrees and we have feet. These are different X and Y's but the same point. Here this point is at a certain XY meters. In this one it's a certain degrees, minutes, and seconds. In this one it's actual feet in the state plane. And of course this is a geographic coordinate system where there are degrees. Types of coordinate systems. There's unprojected, which are geographic coordinate systems, GCS. These are based on spherical coordinates, and their X and Y are degrees of latitude and longitude. Degrees, there's the hint. Projected are flat, and in this example they're showing a light bulb shining through a globe that is clear to create these grid lines. And it, what it does is convert spherical coordinates to flat planar coordinates. And planar is this flat area, flat map over here. And it's done using a set of mathematical equations projecting 3D coordinates to a 2D map. Coordinate systems and data. Every feature class or raster stores X and Y values based on a specific coordinate system. The feature class has a label documenting the coordinate system parameters. The label is critical for pro proper function of the feature class in ArcGIS. Modeling feature behaviors. Modeling feature behavior, constructing data models that mimic real world situations. For example, if two streets cross, the line should meet at an intersection, such as this point right here. 
If an overpass crosses a street, the lines should not intersect. And that is shown right here. They're not intersecting. And two adjacent states should have a single identical boundary between them. In other words, this is a coincident boundary. There are not, there were no, there is not two different boundaries here. They share a boundary. Topology. Topology describes the spatial relationships between features. There's adjacency, connectivity, overlap, and intersection. <clears throat> here is some overlap. Here is some gap. We don't get into that too much in this course, but you will if you go on to further courses. We're just touching on it here. Logical consistency. We do a little bit of this. Just suffice to say, this is an undershoot. This is an overshoot. This is an improper intersection unless this is a bridge going over this. And here is a loop. Uh, again, we don't get into this, the topological errors so much in this course because this is an intro course. Some more topography rules. In this case, Bennett County and Shannon County should have a identical border. There should be no gap or overlap. And the same with South Dakota, it should line up with Nebraska identically. And this county should abut Nebraska. Again, we do not need to worry about topology that much in this course. Vector model types. There are two. There are spaghetti models and topological models. Spaghetti models where features are stored as simple geometry objects. There is no topology. There is no way to test for topology errors. And we manage errors by careful construction and editing of features. Topological models. Features may be stored as simple objects. Complex features may be constructed from simpler ones. This supports complex feature behavior such as a network flow. And it has rules and tools for defining topology and correcting errors. Map scale. Once a scale of one to a hundred thousand, this could actually this could be as they're showing, one centimeter on the map equals a hundred thousand centimeters on the ground. This should could, as this mentions, dimensionsless could be one pencil on a map equals 100,000 pencils on the ground. And this is where we get map scale. More about map scale. Again, I, I mentioned this earlier. A large denominator gives a small fraction or a small scale map. 1 to 50 million shows a very large area. In between these two, 1 to 500,000 shows a little bit smaller area. And then at the bottom, a small denominator gives a larger fraction or a large scale map. 1 5,000th is much bigger than 1 50,000th. So don't get confused with a large scale map being 1 to 5,000 and a small scale map being 1 to 50,000. While the number looks bigger, just remember that there's a 1 over that number, which makes this one up top a lot smaller. Scale and precision. We need not get into scale and precision. If you want to read more about it, you can in the book. We won't be getting into this in this class. Estimating precision from scale, we're not going to be getting to this either. Source scale and display scale. Most GIS data have an intrinsic scale inherited from the source, whereas the display scale varies, which is why this map right here starts to get blurry as we begin to blow it up. In this slide, we're noticing, and 
original scale of 1 to 5 million. So it's a very small scale because that's a very small number. And in this one, the scale is 1 to 25 million. And notice how rigid it is. It cannot get down into finite intri intri intricacies of the 1 to 5 million scale. Scale and resolution again. Resolution is the sampling distance of the stored x and y values. This is a 1 to 5 million scale source. And this is a 1 to 25 million scale source. Notice what is lost when we move to the 25 million. To find a resolution, waste storage space and slows drawing. It stores more points that are needed at a particular display scale. Finding source scale. This is usually documented in the metadata. And we'll talk about metadata later in the course. Data quality issues. Important to note, no data sources are rarely, or data sources are rarely perfect. There is no absolute quality standard. Quality is defined as the fitness of the data set for a particular purpose. Some data sets may be unsuitable for one use, but adequate for another. And that's where it's the fitness of a data set. Going back to the blue one, it all depends on the purpose. And the user, that's you and me, has ethical and legal responsibility to, to determine if a data set is sufficient for its intended use. Geometric accuracy. In this graphic it asks which road is correct. What errors might occur in the location of both. Notice that the road is here in the visual, whereas perhaps a GPS track shows it as off and you may notice this on your personal GPS units as you travel on roads it may show that you're off the road thematic as accuracy how accurate are the attributes things questions you need to ask is how is it measured how accurate are the measurements and what are the sources of error Resolution. Sampling interval of measure, measurements. Spatial sampling is the distance between GPS points along a road, the size of a pixel for elevation or satellite image raster. Thematic resolution is how fine was the measurement scale. W were the data classified after measurement? And temporal, how frequently was the data sampled? Daily, monthly, or every decade? So temporal is time, thematic is the measuring scale, and spatial sampling is the distance or the size of the pixel. Precision, the number of significant digits in a measurement. There's statistical variability of a repeated measurement, and it is not the same as accuracy. GPS units report location to the neatest, nearest meter, that would be a precision of one meter. 20 GPS measurements at the same spot have a standard deviation of 5 meters, meaning the precision is about plus or minus 10 meters. Metadata. We'll get into metadata in a separate lab, but just know that it contains information about the people that information about data that people need to understand the data and to evaluate its quality. It should be provided with every data set, but it is not. And it is advised for in-house data. History of the products. We're going to whip through this. Just know that there used to be coverages, not so much used anymore. Then, became, then there were shapefiles. We'll use shapefiles in this class for the most part. And now the trend is leaning toward geodatabases. In terms of ArcGIS, and we'll, just, we'll talk about 
each of these three things later. In terms of ArcGIS, there's ArcMap, Arc Catalog, and Arc Toolbox. All of these come together in our program, and we're using a workstation. ArcGIS Desktop. There are, here are three different applications of the program so to speak although Arc Toolbox is actually integrated into ArcGIS 10. There's Arc Catalog which is similar to Windows Explorer looking at different files and then Arc Map where we're doing a lot of our analysis and building our maps. Arc Toolbox is usually situated right here and may pull, be pulled up using that button right there or that button right there you will do that in the lab one. Functionality Arc Info is what we're using. It's the most expensive and it's the whole program. Arc Editor is a little bit smaller and then there's Arc View. And they've actually changed the names of these since 2011. I believe this is basic, this is intermediate, and this is advanced. Extensions we get Spatial Analyst, 3D, Network Analyst, Geostatistical Analyst, and several others. They will show up on your toolbar. I'll explain how to activate them once we need them in ArcMap. If you ever get a, a notice that you're not authorized to use the tool, you have to go up and authorize the tool yourself. For some reason, when we install them, they're not automatically turned on, so to speak. Storing data in ArcGIS. Data formats. I told you we were going to come back to these. Coverages had multiple parts. And they did a good job at what they were needing to do. But Esri decided to take it to a different level and create shapefiles. In which everything was included in one file, so to speak. And now there are geodatabases. In a geodatabase, which looks like a storage device, there are feature datasets, which contain feature classes. This will suffice for what you need to know for now. We'll be using shapefiles. If you move on to other courses, you'll end up using geodatabases. They're similar, but not exactly the same. Shapefiles. Shapefiles in Windows Explorer would look like this, and you've seen this. Multiple file names with the same name and a different extension. In Arc Catalog and Arc Map, it'll appear as just one name. Coverages had multiple parts. There was an arc, which was a line. There was a label, which is annotation, a polygon, and then a tick. And the tick that TIC, I believe, was the points around the polygon. Coverage storage, we're not going to need to go over that. We don't use them. Storing arcs, no need to discuss. Connectivity, we'll skip. We'll also skip this. We'll skip over this. And this. Geodatabases, we'll learn a little bit about but getting deep into it during this lecture is overkill. Again, geodatabases. There are three types of geodatabases. You'll probably be using file geodatabases for the most part. Personal database uh, work off the Microsoft Access format, whereas file geodatabases are much more robust and you can store a lot more data. So most people just skip personal geodatabases. What goes in a geodatabase? Feature class, data sets, tables, annotation, rasters. Lots of things can be stored in a geodatabase. You could think of it as one big large folder, but it does much more than that. Essentially, you could consider it a our data folder, but it's Again, it's much more. And this one, you could tell it's a personal geodatabase because it's a Microsoft database format. If it was a file geodatabase, this would be GDB for geodatabase. G 
geodatabases support a variety of data management functions to enhance work. Domains, subtypes, topology, network topology, relationships, and versioned editing, which we won't even come close to getting to, again, because this is an introductory class. And we actually will not get into domains, subtypes, these items up here. There's just not time in this course. Domains, like I said, we're going to skip. Subtypes, we're going to skip. Planner topology, we're going to skip. Network topology, you'll do a lab in future classes with network topology. There's no need to discuss it now. Versioned editing is only SDE geodatabases, and we don't have them. Types of data, this is a nice chart and may be interesting to go back to. There is no reason to discuss it right now. Although, just to look at the, it gives a nice breakdown of what is what. Important. Although Windows permits spaces in a file and folder names and GIS, they're a bad idea. This we learned the very first day. No spaces. Real GIS users flinch when they see spaces anywhere in folder and file names, even when they're allowed. So just don't use them. No spaces. You can use letters numbers and an underscore not even these dashes using arc catalog you'll go through this in lab one but just to quickly display it this is the windows explorer portion of arcgis we have a folder and then within it we have a bunch of different options if this were windows there would be multiple listings for many of these items, particularly the shape files, perhaps the layers. But in our catalog, they're shown just as one, and it's a lot simpler. This is the folder tree. We talked about that in Windows. The menu and toolbars, we talked about those. And then the display window, this is where we had the different types of views and we have different types of views in our catalog we have a contents a preview and a description connecting to folders you must use this connect to folder button and create shortcuts you'll call them a folder connection in the folder connections folder this is already provided you will create connections that are listed on there you may delete them at any time. It's not the data in this folder connections list. It's just the connection. And here's the process to do it. It's much easier to learn when you're doing it in a lab. There are three modes. There's a contents mode that just lists the items. There's a preview where you can see the data or you can see a table of the data by choosing at the very bottom of the screen, screen choosing table. And then there's the description, which is where the metadata is found. Metadata is data about data. The content mode, there's multiple options. We use these, look very similar to Windows 7. This is the details view right there. This is a small icon, so there are no other columns of information. These are large icons. And then there are thumbnails, very similar to Windows 7 when you're in our catalog. Metadata mode. You can view the metadata to evaluate the data quality, but I'll tell you right now, many of these will say required underneath them, and it will be blank. Preview mode. This is where you can look at geography, or down here, hit this down arrow and choose table and you'll be able to see a table of the data within this preview you can zoom in you can go to the fullest extent use the hand to move it around and you'll actually do this in the first lab preview mode table here's where I told you to go down in a table and this is where you can look at the columns of data and you did this in the first lab File Properties. This is where you right click on a file name, go to Properties, and you open up the Feature Class Properties or Shapefile Properties window. 
and explore what's going on with it. Here we have the geographic coordinate system listed. You can find a plethora of information by clicking through these tab tabs. Using ArcMap. This is ArcMap. Similar, over here you have the layers. You have all of the buttons that you need to do things with. The map unit display, it's set in meters. These are handy little hints. This is the drawing or the draw toolbar that may not initially appear. You will add it though because we'll be using it somewhat. On the fly projection. This is what happens when you bring in data to the table of contents, which is right here, and they're not all the same coordinate system. We'll get into that in future chapters. You don't have to mess with it in the first two labs. But projecting on the fly brings these different layers of different coordinate systems that wouldn't normally match up and aligns them in the map view area. We'll get into how that happens. Just know that the first one you put in sets it, and then the rest are projected on the fly or adapted to the very first one you input. Setting the coordinate system. We will go over this in detail in upcoming labs, so there's no need to discuss it now. Just know that this is how you will do it. You'll go here to look, and also, it's a way to change it. Again, we'll cover it later. Notice how this unprojected is stretched. That's the east to west stretching that happens. And our state looks completely different when it's not projected. That's how I can take one quick look at your screen and decide if you've projected it correctly or not. Because unprojected stretches it. Finding a coordinate system. We'll talk about this later. Don't, no need to worry about this slide. Table of contents. This is the viewing mode. You may check the list view, the data view, etc., etc. And if you hover, you can see they will give you hints of the, each one of these icons. Layers are data frames. You could easily rename this to a different name. This is a data frame. And these are actually the layers. The drawing order is goes from the bottom up so if the lakes is on a state you'll see the lake if states was up here looking down you wouldn't be able to see the lakes because the state would be above it turning the layers on and off with a check mark the layer properties is done with this the layer properties is done with this plus or minus and change symbol properties we'll get into that but you can Adapt how your states, for example, look. You could easily do this with lakes based on size or depth, etc. Identifying features, you'd use the identify tool. You click on it and then you click on a feature and you'll pull up the identify window. You d you'll do this in lab one. Layers and layer properties about layers. A layer is a spatial data file together with a set of properties such as symbols, labels, etc. Properties may be modified and stored. It can have group layers stored as files in our catalog held in memory in ArcMap. Creating a layer. You will do this I believe in lab 1 but you, you can, may do it in our catalog or you may do it in our map. We don't usually create layers, but this is how you would do it if you wanted to. A data layer is connected to a shape file. It references a shape file. There's actually not a lot of data in here because it's just a layer. Group layers. You can group layers. We don't do it a lot, so I'm going to skip over this slide. Layer properties, same thing. You right click, go to layers, and you'll get this information. Layers reference the original feature class. They do not store it. Changing a 
properties only affects that layer, not the original feature class, which protects the original feature class. Again, we're not using layers that much, if at all, but it's good to know that you can use them. If the original source is moved or deleted, the layer won't work, which is part of the reason we're not using them. We're just symbolizing our feature classes rather than our layers. General properties. Layer name does not need to match the layer file name. You may use something descriptive. Here we have a scale range. We'll discuss and use this in class so that the map only shows at certain ranges when it's zoomed. Here's the dis display scale range again where zoomed at this level these schools do not show up but if we get down closer then they will show up and there is out beyond and in beyond and we'll set those in one of the labs Symboli symbology properties this is where you change the symbol color and all the information about it we'll do this quite a bit symbol selector we'll go into this extensively just know that you can choose style references and add a whole bunch of different kinds and might be fun to try label properties you can change the way the labels look on the map ArcGIS help this is a big helping feature however it's difficult to learn and I'm going to help help you learn it guide you through it oftentimes I'll say look at a specific help file and I'll give you the name of the help file and you would go up and go to the ArcGIS help and then click in a search term by clicking the search tab and map tips for example and that would pull up tips that are related to map tips I will give you for example displaying map tips I will give you some headway some lead information or ideas of what to type in to prevent you from getting frustrated with this but I will tell you once you get used to using it it is very it's very helpful in creating your maps last but not least least ArcGIS online I hope to have time to discuss this with you right now there are no labs based on it but it's it's quickly evolving this is entirely different than what this slide looks like this was done in 2011 and it's completely different now hopefully we'll get a chance to go into ArcGIS online and create some maps online versus maps just on our desktop And that concludes the end of chapter one. Thank you for sticking through it. If you have any questions, please add them to the discussion forums or send me an email and I'd be glad to help.